Well, may I be seeing you tonight, tonight. How are we doing this wonderful evening? Masih basak kamu ah, mas kugulan. Well, open up your Bibles with me, if you will, to the book of Genesis, chapter four, as we continue waking our way through this book of beginnings. Don't know how much I think it's Imana. We talked about the six days of creation in Genesis chapter one. Tanan tanan ma ayogid, all was very good. Say yapito nga elau pahuay ang ginoo. The Lord rested. He called it the what? Ano nalan? The Shabbat, the Sabbath, the Sabbath day. Now, hindi ka ito yosha, pero it was an example para sa aton. It was showing us how we are to work for six days and rest the seventh that we might set a day for Him. A day to remember, a day to focus on the Lord. Kag, he looked down and he said, All was good. Tanantana may opero may isa ka layin. Ano layin? Si Adam wala asawa. And the Lord said, hey, that's not good. Everything is good except for Adam. We want to make sure that Adam has a helper, someone comparable to him. And the Lord created him Eve, and all was good again. All was right in the garden. Pero nagligit si mana, we went into chapter 3, and something went very, very wrong. Because we're told that Satan, our enemy, ang kontra sa amon, kontra sa aton, the one who is our accuser, he came in in the form of a ano? Manog, a serpent a snake, the most cunning of all creatures, and he did what? He questioned the word of God. Did God say? To confuse Eve, to cause Eve to doubt the word of the Lord. And Eve was deceived. Eve did rebel. She ate. Adam also ate. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized good and evil. They recognized that they had become evil because they had rebelled against the Lord. And they were naked and tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. But we're told the Lord came looking for him in the garden. Kaya yung ikaduwa nga pamangkot sa Bible was Adam, diin ka. Not that the Lord didn't know. The Lord does know. God doesn't ask questions for our sake. He asks questions, I mean, for, for, ask questions for our sake. He wants us to have that opportunity to enoso, to repent, to turn back to him. But Adam did not. Rather than repenting, rather than turning to the Lord, he said, hey, ang babay hatag sa akon, she was the one who gave me the fruit. In other words, God, you made the mistake. You gave me the wrong thing. Lord, you're to blame for my fall. And God said, well, Eve, what did you do? And she said, I'm like, no, he deceived me. No one took responsibility, so there was consequence. There was a penalty that was given. To Eve, she would have pain in childbirth, sorrow because she was bringing children into a salawang, a kalibutan, a sinful world. Also, her desire would be for her husband, but her husband would rule over her. Kai Adam... For him, it would be difficult because the soil would no longer bear the fruit that it was supposed to. Thorns and thistles. Tanan Tanan was cursed because of his decision, because of his fall. All of creation fell under the curse now because of Adam's choice. And also by the sweat of his brow. He would work hard for what he had to do from then on. And the Lord removed them from the garden because he did not want them to get to the tree of life. He did not want them to remain in their sinful state. So Adam and Eve are now cast out. Perfection has been lost. Sin has now entered the world. That's where we pick up our Bible study this evening in Genesis chapter 4. Let's begin by reading verses 1 to 2. Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Helen uno hasta dos. Just two verses to begin with. Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Stop right there. Because we're introduced to Dwaka Bata, the two sons of Adam and Eve. Ang una, his name was Cain. Now Cain means I have acquired or I have gotten. The idea is, is that even Adam thought, Ay, arat na ang bata promesa halin sa gino, the, the child the Lord promised us, the one that would strike the head of the serpent, the Messiah who will save us. We have now been given this promised son. They thought that Cain was the one to deliver them. Now, I understand the confusion because they had received the promise, but it turns out the Messiah would not come for four years thousand more years. That's really being off in their timing. They were way early. They were way... They were way off in what their prediction was because God's timing, by the way, is almost never 
our timing. Ato ang pinsar ko ng promise na sa Ginoo, subong na lang, no? <laughs> Lord, you promised me I'll pick on you guys. Uh, spouse, bana ako na sawa. Lord, subong, no? And the Lord goes, hindi na lang. Dugay, dugay na ang basi. The Lord doesn't give us what we want right away. He promises something that will come eventually. Remember, we're told in 2 Peter chapter 3, <coughs> that to the Lord a day is unto a thousand years. Ang isa ka alaw para sa... And a thousand years is like a day. Time is not the same to God, and we need to be patient to wait upon His timing. So, Eve, Adam, they thought first, hmm, this is the promised child. Turns out, most definitely not. So, verse 2, we're told they had a second son whose name was Abel. Now, the name Abel means vanity or vapor or smoke. And the idea is probably it suddenly set in, nakantindi na sila, they suddenly realize, klero na sila, grabe, the price of sin has come home. We recognize now how bad we really have it. Life is vain. Life is empty. We no longer have our relationship with the Lord. We're no longer walking with the Lord, adlao adlao, in the Garden of Eden. Maybe it was the pain of childbirth, kay sigurado sakit na. That was the curse. Eve would bear children in pain. Or basi mayar kay Adam damo iabalhas. Because of the work and they realized, man, life is not what it used to be. I have to think, poor Adam and Eve, oise ila. For they are the only people who have ever had a relationship with God, to have walked with God, and to have lost that relationship. Can you imagine the pain and the agony that would be? You would wake up every day and go, if only we had not eaten. If only we had not rebelled. If only we had not deceived, we could still be in perfection. We could still be walking with the Lord. Life had become vain, empty. And so they named their son Abel. Now you might think, wow, that's rough. God was hard on them. It was very difficult for them. But make no mistake about it, God does not punish us because he's angry with us. I think often we think, Aton Pinsar, Ara sa gino sa langit, Basi may anong, Isa ka anong bell there, Or what have you, Stick, Basi may bat, And he's just waiting, Oh, may sala ka sigurado, Balbas imo. He's ready to kind of beat us, And take us to the mat. But no, God's not like that. God does not punish us in anger. He punishes us out of love. God desires that we live a holy life. He wants us to live a pure life. And He teaches us, trains us, by allowing us to experience the consequences of our actions. That's why the writer of Hebrews would say in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, You have forgotten. The exhortation that is written as unto children, that the Lord punishes every child that he receives. And if we are not punished, then we are not a child of God. Listen, it is the difficulties, it is the hardships that the Lord allows us to go through that prove that we are the children of the Lord. Because he wants us to live that holy, that pure, that righteous life. Hey, life was difficult, life was vain. But God was teaching Adam and Eve to follow and to live before the Lord. But there were two very different sons. I want you to notice in verse 2, we're given their professions, not just their names. Cain, acquired, Abel, vanity. But they had different jobs. Abel was a shepherd. He was one that worked in the field. Now this is kind of an unusual job. If you remember, it is not until Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, that the command is allowed and given for men to be able to eat meat. So, what was the purpose for them? Basi may dua ka reasons. So, una gid, may kanero sila, may mga sapat sila, para ilabayo. They may have used the wool for their clothing. In fact, God, if you remember, had given them that lesson. If you remember last week, sa si mana. When they left the garden, God clothed them with sheep's skin, with animal skin. So they had learned, hey, clothing can be made out of animals. So maybe they had it for ilabayo. Pero mayara mambasi 
they had it for mga halad. That they had learned also from the Lord that this is a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. This is something that you can use to be able to give a sacrifice to the Lord. A, a picture, by the way, that ultimately will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who was the Lamb of God, John chapter 1 declares to us, who takes away the sin of the world. So it's a picture from the very beginning, this offering of sacrifice, this idea of halatz mga sapat, is there right in the very introduction of the book of Genesis. So those two reasons probably is what Abel kept these sheep for, was there for clothing and there for sacrifices. Pero si Cain, laine obra, he was a farmer. He grew crops. Now this, by the way, is much more practical because Cain was growing crops para ila pagkaon. He's growing the food that they consume every day. And in fact, the job that Cain have arguably is the better job. Because it's the command that was given to Adam. You remember in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, God commanded Adam to do what? Till the ground. This is before sin. So this was always God's plan for man to be a farmer, to work in the soil, to work in making your own food. So Cain was following in his father's footsteps, doing what God had commanded for his father to do, even, by the way, in the curse. Genesis 3:17. It was still farming that God told man to do. He told Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to farm. So farming was absolutely a, a noble profession. There was nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Pero, there was something wrong with Cain. There was nothing wrong with his profession, but there was something wrong with him. Basi na lang. Wala pa sigurado ni, but basi na lang. Can you imagine if your parents thought that you were going to be the Messiah? You were going to save us all. You were the promised one who was going to come and strike the head of the serpent. You grew up with this great expectation and it turned out, you were just a sinner. And how disappointed you might feel in yourself. How much disappointed you might feel in your parents. And it may be some of why Cain was a bitter man, a broken man, a man who no longer had a heart for the Lord. I gotta say, para sa mga ginikanan, pasi mayra ka mo dugay-dugay, mga mga bata, remember this. Do not put heavy expectations upon your children. Don't train them and think, dugay, dugay, ikaw, ma doctor ka, kon ma, you know, uh, engineer ka, or no pagade. You're going to be somebody very important. Kay, damo mga kwarta, ikaw, yung masaporta sa ako, and you'll take care of me in my old age. Be cautious. Be careful. The Lord never tells us to put heavy weights upon our children. In fact, He never even tells us to tell our children how to live their lives. He tells us to teach our children, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, about Him. That is our responsibility. To train them up, to let them have a relationship with God, and to let God be able to dictate to them, show them, reveal to them what He wants them to be. The problem with Cain is there was great expectation, too much expectation upon Him, and it drove Him from the Lord. Well, let's pick up in verse 3 is we find that there were sacrifices that were given. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance or his face fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So there were two offerings. Two offerings that the sons brought to the Lord. Now this idea in the process of time probably carries the idea of ma'idad nasila. Wala na hoban, wala na batasila. May, masi, medyo, may dad na, hindi tigulangge. But they're probably in their 20s or 30s or no man. They're mature now. So in the process of their time, when they've come to the right age, they desire to bring a gift. Now, it's important to understand, this is not the idea of halal para ila salat. 
That doesn't seem to be what's talked about here. It is a regalo para sa gino, a gift to the Lord. They want to bless the Lord. They want to take from what they have received, ila, ila mga sapat, upon their fruits, ila mga bunga, and give it to the Lord to be able to say thank you to Him. Interesting. This is some, oh, give or take, we'll say, 2,500 years before the law of Moses where the idea of tithing was commanded of people. Yet in the very beginning, there was this concept that we want to give back to the Lord. We want to bless the Lord with what He has blessed us with. And this idea of tithing, I think people are very uncomfortable with it. Because to be honest, they do not understand it. They think, importante gid. It is a law, by the way. It is commanded of God that you give tagpila. Tagpila hat tag sa gino. 10%. Indeed, lang. Actually, that's wrong. Do you know the law doesn't say that? The law doesn't say give 10%. The law says give 23%. People don't often recognize that. They don't realize that. They think, oh, 10% na lang. No, the law actually says 23%. There are three different tithes in the law of Moses. Numbers chapter 18, verses 21 through 24, there is the Levitical tithe. Hat like sa mga Levites, sa mga pari, because they didn't have any work and you were providing for those who ministered before the Lord. It was basically a salary, sweldo, para sa mga pari. But there was a second tithe, according to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. There was the tithe of all that you received in your harvest. So when you came in, whenever you harvested your crop, you always gave 10%, the first fruits back to the Lord. So there was a tithe, para sa mga pari, there was a tithe of all of your harvest. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 28, there was a tithe every three years. Para sa mga na lang. So if you add it all together, there was two tithes for 10% and one tithe every three years for 10%. So mga 3% na lang. It's 23% kada tuig. Hat lag And you're going, I didn't like 10%. Ni namin ko 10% na lang. 23 sigurado ni namin ko. That is the law. I'm always amazed that people go back to the law when it's very clear we are under grace. The law is not a buffet. You can't go back to the law and say, well, I want to take out the tithing requirement, but I don't want to keep the part about sacrificing animals. If you're going to keep the tithing requirement, you better find a temple, you better grab a carnero, and you better go and offer it because you're all under the law or you're none of the law. You cannot be dua dua lang. It's all or nothing with the law. And the law, by the way, never made anyone perfect, so you do not want the law. The New Testament command for giving, you ready for this? Is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Give what you want and give out of a joyous heart. Kung gusto hatag damo, pwede. Kung gusto hatag wala gin, pwede. Dispedisimo. You give whatever is on your heart to give. There's no command, there's no requirement, there's no necessity to it. It should be a response to the Lord. Now, I'll give you this. Parehas ang mga aliso, if you're going to go planting seeds, and you plant yung mga aliso, Ano yung mo, ano? Harvest. How much are you going to pull out of your harvest? Chutay naman. If you harvest much, what are you going to pull out of your harvest? Much. A moment ago, you know, the Lord says, hey, if you sow abundantly, you'll reap abundantly. There's truth to that, but there's no requirement in it. And we don't sow to try to reap. We sow because of a desire to bless the Lord, because we want to be involved in the work of the Lord. There is a freedom in it. That's the law of grace. That's the command that God gives us. And by the way, I, I think it's the same command that we're seeing illustrated here in Genesis chapter 4. I think it's the problem of Cain. Because Cain came not to give out of love, but he came giving out of 
necessity, out of obligation, out of rule and regulation. And therefore, the offering of Abel was accepted where the offering of Cain was rejected. Now, there are those, mayroon ang basila, ang problema na lang ang klase sang halad. They go, ah, yeah, the reason why that was the case is because Cain gave a better offering. Or uh, Abel gave a better offering. Because it was a mga sapat. It was an offering of blood. Which is the only offering accepted by the Lord. See, Cain's was an offering from the ground. The ground is cursed. Therefore, the offering was not received. But hindi ito odina. Because you can go back to the book of Leviticus chapter 1. And not chapter 2. And both offerings are acceptable to love. Biskin po may halat sa mga sapat. O may halat sa mga tanom. He accepts both of those. It wasn't a problem of the style of the offering. It was a problem of the heart of the giver of the offering. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 gives us some insight. When we're told that Abel by faith, by faith gave a more perfect sacrifice to the Lord. The difference was is how Abel gave, not what Abel gave. Cain gave with the wrong heart. Therefore, God didn't want it. I think it's very common. Sa mga tao, kung hatag sila sa simbahan, hatag sila kay, pasi, they feel like it's required. O kung wala hatag ako 10%, pasi, wala bugay halin sa gino o para sa akon. O kung they think, if I give, everybody around me will think I'm very holy and righteous. <laughs> you know, have you ever noticed? But when people give, they like to make a bit of a show of it. You know, they whip out, oh, there's, you know, and they turn around. And they kind of feel like, oh, I'm somebody special. Look at that, I'm going to put it in there. So I feel like I'm somehow more holy than others. But they don't give out of their necessity, they give out of their overflow. If I have, you know, 30 pesos in my pocket, I'll give five, no problem. Okay, I have a lot left over. They don't give out of a heart for the Lord. They give with the wrong motivation. And I got to tell you, all of those are the wrong reasons to give. Jesus would say in Mark chapter 12, basi doon naman ang story ni, may isa ka widow, wala ba na siya, she gave in the temple, doon naman kaon tagpila iya hatag, two mites, paresa 50 centavos na lang, isa ka peso, kulang isa ka peso, 50 centavos na lang, siya mga hatag sa ginoo. And the Lord stopped. Yes, she stopped. Jesus went, Did you see that? I'm sure the disciples went, oh, no, no. I'm mga pigado de no. That's not a thing to look at. He goes, No, she gave more than tenan tenan, did he? Everything else put together, she gave more than they did. Because she gave not out of her abundance, she gave out of her necessity. It showed how important the Lord was to her. Even if it meant basi kulang a kwarta. I want to know that the Lord understands how much He means to me. Because listen, God doesn't need anything, by the way. Psalms, chapter 50, verse 9. Psalms 59 tells us that the Lord has need of nothing. Tanantananiya. He made the whole world. Sabidong sa kalibutaniya. So it's not like God says, oh, you know, pwede mahulam ko ina? Kaya kulang akong kwarto subong. You know, because, you know, I'm just a little short. God never says that. God doesn't need anything from us. It's not about the necessity. It's not about the need. It's about the heart to give. It's about the heart to bless. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, Do not give so others see. Give in secret so that your Father who sees in secret can reward you and bless you openly. This was the problem with Cain. He gave to the Lord, but he gave with the wrong heart. And therefore, God said, I don't want it. Well, notice verse 5. This did not go over well with Cain. He became angry 
and his countenance or his face fell. He was very disappointed in what had taken place. He felt like he should have received more recognition, more glory from the point, Lord. But he missed the point. He didn't understand what God wanted. Kabana kama nao gusto ang ginao? Kasi ito hindi kwarta. Hindi importante sa iya kwarta. Hindi importante para sa iya aton mga gamit. Ano gusto ang ginao? Halin sa aton? Our hearts. God doesn't want our stuff. God wants us. Cain missed it. He did not get it. And therefore, he was upset about it. He expected recognition. He expected glory. He expected God to be able to say, wow, what an awesome thing you've done. And the Lord's going, I didn't want your stuff. I wanted you. And you missed that. So God asks him. One of several questions he's going to ask Cain. Cain, why are you Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Now, Naman, kabrongino. It's not that he was asking the question. God never asks a question. Kaya wala kabolosya. He asks a question para may oportunidad para sa aton. He's basically going, Cain. Let me see if I can teach you. Let me see if I can show you that the problem is your heart. Let me see if I can get you to repent because God's desire was for him to examine himself. Listen, Paul would say the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. He said, we need to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. We need to check our hearts. If we're upset with the Lord, if we're frustrated with God, if we're not happy with our walk, yes, a lot. Sigurado hindi. Yan ang problema. Sakon na lang. And God's trying to get Cain to look inwardly, to recognize his problem, to see his heart. And he tells Cain two things. If you do well, you will be accepted. This word well, used 107 times in the Old Testament, carries the idea of doing wisely. It's often translated as doing correctly, doing good, being content. Listen, Cain, if you understood what it was that I wanted, if you understood that I'm looking for you, you would be fine. Your offering would be received. In fact, Micah chapter 6, verse 8 tells us, He has shown you, O man. Probably know the song. What is good and what the Lord requires of you? To do justly, to walk humbly, and to love mercy. This is what God wants. He wants us just to walk with Him, to walk before Him, to be humble in His presence and depend upon Him. Do good. Seek me. Man, depend upon the Lord, Cain, and you're not going to have to worry. You'll be accepted. Pero, God gives him a warning. If you do not do well, then sin is crouching at your door. This is a little scary if I'm honest. It's quite a vivid picture. The idea is, kung wat kita sa aton balay, ara lang sala, hula para sa aton. It's there waiting. And it wants us. It wants to stumble us. It wants to consume us. It wants to see if it can't trip us up. If we do not recognize the fact that God desires to have a relationship with us, if we miss the importance of having a heart for the Lord, sin is waiting for us to keep us from coming to God. Jesus would say in John chapter 8, verse 34, I say unto you, he who commits sin becomes a slave to sin. Delicate to salat, by the way. I see my... Can I get a story called Kagina Sakon, amigo? I've known him for years and years and years. Iyasawa has, she's run away. Real tough situation. Buta buta lagi para sa Iyasubong. May talaga bata pero gubaya marriage. It's a difficult situation. And we talked about how dangerous sin is. We don't recognize or realize it's subtle. It pulls us in and it says, okay na lang. Isa basis na lang, testing na lang. And we step in and we try it. Whatever it might be, whatever might be a temptation to our heart. Maybe it's that relationship. 
Maybe it's getting too close before marriage. Maybe it's taking something that we shouldn't take, kawat. Maybe it's lying to try to find a way to move forward in life. Whatever it might be, whatever sin may tempt us, it is a slippery slope that takes us from God. And ultimately comes from a lack of understanding of what God desires for us. He wants to know us. In fact, the Apostle Paul would say in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, you become a slave to whomever you choose to obey. Either a slave to sin, which leads to death, or a slave to Jesus Christ, which leads to life. There's God lays it out. He says, Cain, do you understand? Do well. Get to know me. Follow me. Have a relationship with me. You'll all be just fine. Pero kung hindi, sin's waiting for you, looking for you. It's at your door the moment you step outside and it wants to rule over you. Well, Cain did not choose wisely. Let's pick up in verse 8. <coughs> Sin found him. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. And it came to pass when they were in a field, Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, said to Abel. And Cain said, but I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be upon the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon him, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Cain was given an option. He was given the opportunity. He was shown the issue with his heart and saying, Hey, listen, do good, or you're going to find that sin is going to take over your life. He chose sin. Because rather than change, rather than humble himself, we're told that Cain hardened his heart. Hardened his heart towards the Lord so much so that he took his brother out into a field. This is intentional, by the way. It wasn't accidental. It didn't, wasn't like, a, oh, Ariko, I didn't know you were going to be here. It was, come with me. I want to talk to you. For no doubt, Abel was trying to encourage his brother. Kai just not Abel. What's Abel? He had the right heart. I'm sure he's going, Cain, you need to get right with God. Cain, just turn back. God will accept you. How did Cain respond? By silencing his brother. He took him out in a field and he murdered him. So he no longer felt the conviction that his brother brought to him. Sin separates. It separates us from God. It separates us from others. Because we don't want to be around Christians. If we're making bad choices, listen. Where's that person? I don't see them anymore. What happened to them? Always the answer is sin. Sin comes in and we don't want to be reminded of the choice we're making. We don't want to be convicted by the people around us. And so we start to avoid the Bible, avoid church, avoid prayer, avoid anything that's going to remind us of it. Hopefully we don't get to the place where Cain got, where we kill those who try to convict us and show us the way back to the Lord. Cain silenced the conviction because of how much he had hardened his heart towards the Lord. First John chapter 3, verse 12 tells us that Cain was of the wicked one. 
Literally, he was of Satan. Why did he murder Abel? Because his works or his deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. He wanted to silence his conviction, silence his brother, therefore he murdered him. Now, verse 9, may pamangot naman. We're told that God came to Cain and said, Cain, sorry si Abel. Now, he knew what happened. But he's giving that opportunity. He's saying, listen, you've made a big mistake. You just murdered somebody. By the way, think about this. How much sin is already in the world? There's only four people right now that we know of. There's Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. Cain already killed Abel. They're back to three people. I mean, that's how quick sin had come into the world. And God's like, listen, you can still have hope. There's still a possibility to return. Where is your brother? Repent, turn. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, kita, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't make a difference what we've done. Even murder, by the way. If murder was unforgivable, God would have come to Canaan just right there and killed him on the spot. He did not kill him. He gave him an opportunity. He questioned him and said, Dini mo atud. Dini ka. I can forgive you, but you must confess. Just let me know. Cain, verse 10, rather than repent, instead, pretended he didn't know. Sadini mo atud. I'm both. Why would I know? It's not my problem. Not my responsibility. There was no remorse. No brokenness. For the murder of his brother, he didn't even care. There was nothing left there. And therefore the Lord responded and said, The blood of your brother cries out to me. I know exactly what you have done, Cain. You cannot hide it. I think we think that we can get away with sin. The Lord hasn't done anything yet. He hasn't killed me. He hasn't punished me. He hasn't taken everything I have. Hey, apparently it's not that bad. We kind of hide it. We keep it kind of quiet. We can get away with this, right? Hebrews 4.13 There is nothing hidden from God's sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of Him whom we must give an account. God sees it all. He knows everything. Whatever sin is in our life, whatever little sin we try to hide, whatever thing we think that nobody else knows, maybe even our spouse, our best friends don't know. God knows. And He very well may be patient. He might even say, hey, Ano ka? Ano, ano, ano himon ka? What you doing? What's going on? Not because he doesn't know, because he wants to see if he can't draw us out, bring us to repentance, try to see if he can't restore us. Because ultimately, if we don't, he will convict us. Notice verse 12. Cain, because of what you've done. Now mind you, it's not just the murder. It's the lack of repentance of the murder. Because of your sin and your unwillingness to soften, your unwillingness to inosol, to turn back to me, therefore the ground will be cursed for your sake. The ground that opened up its mouth to receive the blood of Abel, it will no longer give you any fruit. You will receive no fruit of the ground. No more, no longer will the ground bear anything for you because you have taken a life, because you've not repented of your sin, you will become a fugitive. That word fugitive, by the way, means to wander aimlessly. You'll have no place. And you'll become a vagabond. Literally means you're going to be running for your life. Your existence now is going to be one of terror and fear because you've rejected the forgiveness of God. Now, at that, Cain cried out, finally. He goes, oh, my punishment is too much for me. Lord, it's too much. I can't bear it. 
because for sure, Cain knew, I'm now going to be a fugitive and a vagabond, and anybody who finds me as I'm running for my life, wandering around, anybody who tracks me down, they're going to kill me because of what I did. So the Lord said, hey, no problem. Anybody that touches you, I will restore, I will bring vengeance upon sevenfold. He put a mark upon him to keep him safe, but he did not forgive him because he refused to turn back to God. This repentance, this I'm sorry, this it's too much for me, is the wrong kind of repentance. We talked about this in the Zimana. That 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, worldly sorrow that leads to death. It's that guy who, Sagabi, Damo Inomsha, Bugtao sa saga, sakit, sakit, giri ulo, and he goes, ay, no sul ko, sigurado, wala, inong gid. I'm never going to drink ever again. Pero, later that night, ano siya? Inong ni what? Because there was not a repentance, there was not a turning away from sin, there was just a regret of the consequences that's came. He regretted his consequences. He said, it's too much for me, my punishment. But he didn't say, Lord, forgive. But ask Judas. When Judas betrayed Jesus Christ, when he was done with the betrayal, we're told that he repented. He was sorry for what he had done. But he was just sorry because of the consequences, not because of the sin. He didn't turn back to the Lord. He just regretted the consequences and the actions that had come from his choices. That's not. That's worldly sorrow and it leads to death. Cain did not repent, which caused, notice verse 16, him to leave the presence of the Lord. That there is one of the heaviest verses. That's something you never, ever, ever, ever want to have happen, and you don't ever want to know anybody that that happens to. That's someone who says, I don't want God. I'm done with God. I am leaving the presence of God. I no longer want to feel the conviction of God. He left the presence of the Lord. He chose to live a lifestyle of sin and destruction rather than forgiveness and salvation. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13. Amazing verse by the way tells us to warn each other ad lao, ad lao, daily. Lest our heart be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin and we turn from the living God. Why would someone turn away from God? God who loves us, God who gave His only Son that we would have forgiveness, God who would do anything for us, God who created us knowing that it would cost Him His life. Why would we turn from Him? Because sin hardens our heart so that we don't want him. Cain left the presence of the Lord. Well, questions before we go on into the genealogy of Cain in verse 17 through 24. Oh, that's wrong about what? See? We'll get there. Because we're going to talk about that because the next question is going to be, who does Cain marry? And it's going to be from the same answer. Because that's always a classic question. Who, who was Cain's wife? Adam, Eve, Abel's dead. So there's that lakatawa so lang. So who did Cain marry? We'll get there in a second. <laughs> Probably doesn't question. We'll get there momentarily. Hold on to that question. Both of those are good questions, by the way. You guys are paying attention. I like that. There's more than three people right now. There are only three people we're given the names of. We'll talk about that in just a second as we get into verse 17. Herbin, do you have a question? Say what? Okay. This is the question to be asked. Okay, who's going to kill Cain? Yes. We would assume yes. The question is, is, did Adam and Eve know that Cain had killed Abel? Yes. I wouldn't imagine they could have hidden that. In fact, we're going to get there in a minute because 
We're going to see at the end of chapter 4, when Eve bears another son named Seth, that there's kind of a joy because she's, God has given me almost like a second chance. Because she understands that Abel's dead and Cain is not a good guy. So, kapalo sila. May sa papamako? Let's answer the one question the three of you had. Let's pick up at verse 17 through 24 as we now get the genealogy of Cain. The, we'll say the mga batak, the mga apo ni Cain. We're given a short list of the people that came from his line. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore Enoch. And he built the city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Arad, and Arad begot Mahujel, and Mahujel begot Methuselel, and Methuselel begot Lamech. And Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. Uh, he was the father of those who dwelt in tents and had livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all those who played the harp and the flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman of bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama, which just means beautiful. And then Lamech said to his wives, Ada, Zillah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Kind of weird, he refers to himself in a third person, but he does. Listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God had appointed another seed to be instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. As for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. And men began to call upon the name of the Lord. So Cain gets married. Who is the wife of Cain? It would seem like, wait a minute, it's Adam, Eve, got Cain, so where did the wife come from? The answer is actually very simple, though we probably don't like it. Ia utod. It was his sister. Because Adam and Eve, we're told in Genesis chapter 5, verse 4, had more sons and daughters. Now, they lived to be 900 some odd years we're not just talking about pulo, kumbente, they could have shen gabata, they could have a lot of kids. So there was a lot of different people to be married to, but you were going to marry your sister. That was the only option. And we go, ooh, that's terrible. Why would you, oh, that's horrible. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 9, the law states in the pwede makasali mo utod. That is, by the way, the law of God. You're not allowed to marry your sister. You're not allowed to marry them. That is the law of God. But the reason why it became the law of God, pasi wala ka bloka mo, kung makasali mo utod, kung napit sa imo parente, the problem is your genetic code is too close. So, mas tako ang chansa may disability sa imobata. That's why you're not to marry close relatives. But in the very beginning, there was no, there was no problems in the genetic code. Their genes were perfect. Their DNA was spotless. So, bisikin ko nung imo utod, makasal, wala problema para sa imobata, sa unagid. But very quickly, it became a problem, which is why the law said, Indi pwede makasali mo utod. So just to clarify, it was fine back in the days of Cain. He married his sister, no problem. And don't do that today. Very dangerous, very bad. You'll probably end up with lots of problems with your kids. That's why we're not supposed to do that. But notice in verse 18 that we're given a list of children and grandchildren from Cain. And there were a couple things we really quickly want to notice here, but I think they're kind of important. The first one, we're told that Batani Cain is a guy named Enoch. And Enoch built the first city. This is the first time a city is mentioned in the Bible. I find it interesting that the one to build the city is someone who had walked away from the presence of the Lord. In other words, there is a hint, there is a suggestion 
that actually God doesn't really desire cities. That is not really his plan or his purpose for mankind. Cities tend to be, if I'm honest, the hotbed of sin, not of righteousness. It's interesting to me. When you go into a city, there's a lot of lights. There's very little plants. All of the evidence of God's creation has been removed. You live there, you do not see the evidence that God has made us. You're not reminded of His creation. You're not reminded of the fact that He has a plan for us. Cities tend to be places where the greatest of sin takes place. And I think, and again, it's a bit of an assumption, and I don't go too far with that. I'm not saying that, you know, let's all leave our cities and abandon them. That's not the point. But I do find it interesting that it's a city first established by the son of a man who'd walked away from the Lord. But there's a second thing I want you to notice, and it's a little more subtle, but it's quite interesting. Notice we're given a brief generation. Not very many. They all die in the flood, by the way. All of the descendants of Cain. So the flood, they all were lost. That's why the generations don't go very far. But we're told there was Enoch, Lyrad, Mahuchael, Methusael, and Lamech. Now we read those in English. We go, Pero those names have meaning. And the meaning is interesting. Enoch means dedicated. Lyrad means donkey or stubborn. Mahujael means blotted out by God. Methusael means who is God. And Lamech means despairing. Now you put those names together and the line of Cain becomes those who were dedicated to sin and stubborn so they were blotted out by God so they no longer knew who God was and it caused them to despair. How's that for a genealogy? They what? Should I say that again? Okay. okay. I like this. I think this is actually pretty powerful. The genealogy of Cain, Yamangabata, Yamangapo, is that they were dedicated, Enoch, to sin, stubborn. They were blotted out by God so that they no longer knew who was God and it caused them to despair. This is the genealogy, this is the heritage of a man who walked away from the presence of the Lord. And I got to tell you, it's really important for you and I to see this because mga ginikanan, mga lolo, lola, we set an example that passes down from one generation to another. That example can be a good example, by the way. I, I, I love my, my testimony, my heritage. I had the godliest of men as a father. Now, he wasn't a bad guy, but he wasn't necessarily the same as my dad. My dad, really, the Lord got a hold of his heart. And I know and I believe firmly I'm a pastor today because of my father. Now, I, I was a troublesome teenager. But there was a testimony, there was a heritage that passed down that was a good one. Pero puede malayan man. We can pass on a bad example to our children, to our grandchildren, to our great-grandchildren. We can be an example for them for good or for evil. Cain was most definitely for evil. We see that, by the way, in verses 19 with a guy named Lamech. Lamech, whose name means despairing. Notice, my duaka asawa. This is interesting. Ang isakasawa, her name was Ada. Ada means, by the way, ornament or, or important. Ang iban, zila, her name means shadow. Or basi, hindi importante. And there's a hint that what was taking place here is having walked away from God, nikilala si Dios na, that they no longer understood the plan of God for marriage. So my dua ka asawa na, sigurado sa laina, by the way. The Old Testament never condemns that. The New Testament very clearly does. Although the Old Testament never condemns it, instantly we see that it's not good. Because 
he didn't understand the plan for God. He was just doing whatever he wanted to do. It didn't realize the ramifications of it. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. When we reject God, we just do what's right in our own eyes. Because the plan of our Creator, the purpose that God had for marriage, as we talked about, was so important. And marriage is absolutely between one man and one woman. Only. But notice when a society begins to reject God, when a society no longer thinks about God, when they remove God from their consciousness, suddenly, or basi, it's important. I know I'm gender na. That's the newest one, by the way. We're non-binary. Ano kasubong? Lelaki kung babae, wala pa sigurado. How crazy and nonsense is that? But it comes from exactly what we're seeing right here. It is that they have rejected God. They have forgotten about God. They've been blotted out by God. And they no longer now understand the purpose and the plans of God. And they're just doing what's ever right in their own eyes. Lamech was a fool. Because he was a man who had been given a heritage where he did not know who God was. A side note quickly though. His kids uh, apparently were very talented kids. Uh, we do read about some very interesting advancements in science here in the very beginning. Uh, he had one son named Jabal, who's the father of everybody who takes care of animals. So my, you know, Bantay Kanero Shah, he was uh, very good at that apparently. And my Iskat Jubal, he was the father of all those who played instruments. So all of a sudden you have instruments. This is before the flood. This is in the very beginning. Already they're forming harps and flutes. Sagat Gitzela. And even Tubal Cain. He was good with metallurgy. He was the, a metalsmith. He could make swords or whatever else he wanted to. So already here in the very beginning, you have a whole lot of creativity. Pero wala relationships again all. And that led to moral bankruptcy, which we see in verses 23 through 24, where Lamech came home one day and he said, Konasawa, Lamech, your husband, I say, I declare, I have killed a man. Now, interesting why he says he killed a man. Because the young man hurt him. That word hurt, by the way, just means to punch. He was wounded. The word means to bruise. So in other words, someone came up to him and went, hit him, and he killed him for it. It was a complete overreaction. It shows the moral depravity of what had taken place. In fact, his declaration was, hey, if Cain is protected by God with a mark, and anyone who touches him is cursed sevenfold. I am protected by God, and I'll curse anybody who hurts me 70 times seven. I, I found that number interesting. Because Jesus used the exact same number. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 18, verse 22? Peter comes to Jesus, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times. How does Jesus answer? 70 times 7. So the heart of our Lord is forgiveness without end. The heart of Lamech was revenge without end. How far they had fallen, how quickly they had washed away with such depravity, by the way, that the only solution for mankind is going to very quickly be a flood that destroys all life. But... Notice verse 25. Adam and Eve had another son. His name was Seth. Seth, by the way, means appointed. He's appointed by God to be what Abel couldn't be because he was killed. He's appointed by God to be what Cain can't be because he'd rejected God. It would be through Seth that the Messiah would come. In fact, Seth is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 3, verse 38. Adam begot Seth is the beginning of that genealogy that leads to Jesus Christ. And we're told that Seth had a son named Enosh. And it was in the days of Enosh that men began to call out once again upon the name of the Lord. They recognized the best my dama mga salawayan. And sigurado may dama mga salawayan. Tanamang abata ni Cain, tanamang apo ni Cain. 
that I'm about to set. They had the desire to follow the Lord, to stand up against the world, the society, the way things were going and say, no, we want to know and worship God. And I'm going to say, 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 Pero we need to be like the children of Seth, like Enosh, to stand up and go, no, I'm going to stand for Jesus Christ. It's important enough to know the Lord. You need to know about the message of the Lord. The man Balita, you need to know about the gospel that can heal sin. That was the children of Seth. Quickly, and we'll be quick in this, by the way, because it's just a genealogy. Let's finish up with chapter 5. Listen along. We'll read it very fast. But we're given here, now the children of Adam. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam on the day that God created man. He made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day that they were created. Kind of a synopsis, a review of chapter 1 there when God created man and created Adam and Eve. Adam lived to 130 years and he begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And after he begot Seth, Adam lived another 800 years and he had sons and daughters, so bata, so that all the days of Adam were 930 years. Gagbataisha. Seth lived to 105 years, and he begat Enosh. Now, after he begat Enosh, Seth lived 807 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth's life were 912 years. Gagbataisha. Enosh lived 90 years, and he begat Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enos lived another 815 years, and he begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Enos were 905 years. Kalpataisha. Canaan lived 70 years, and he begot Mahalel. After he begot Mahalel, Canaan lived another 840 years, had sons and daughters, so that the days of Canaan were 910 years. Kalpataisha. Mahalel lived 65 years. He begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalel lived another 830 years. Kalpataisha. He had kids. So all the days of Mahalel were 195 years, and he died. Jared lived 162 years, and he begot Enoch. Now we will talk about Enoch real quickly. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived to 800 years, had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, called Bataisha. Enoch lived to 65 years, and he begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God for 300 years, had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were only 365 because Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Now Methuselah lived 187 years and he begot Lamech. And after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 700 years, 782 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, oldest man in the Bible. Now Lamech lived 182 years, had a son, and he named his son Noah. This one will comfort us concerning our work in the toil of our hands because of the ground which was cursed by the Lord. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived another 590 years, had sons and daughters, so the days of Lamech were only 777 because he died in the flood, by the way. Lamech died in the flood and he died and Noah was 500 years old when he begat Tabakabatha, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Really quickly, I want to look at just a couple things here. First of all, there is a list of names. It is the genealogy from Adam to Noah. It takes us from creation to the flood. And we want to look at two individuals within this, and then we want to look at the group of them. The one we want to look at first is Enoch. Because Enoch is unique, obviously. Verses 21 through 24. For Enoch lived 365 years, and then he was not. For God took him. According to Jude chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, Enoch was a prophet. He was the first prophet. We're told that Enoch prophesied, Look, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his holy ones. He will bring the people of the world to judgment. This is Jude chapter 1, verse 14. He will convict the ungodly of all the evil things that they have done in rebellion and the results of the godless sinners God has spoken against him. He was a preacher of righteousness. He warned of a judgment to come. He warned the people that their rebellion against God would ultimately cost them and God would come and make them pay for it. He also prophesied when 
the flood would come. For Enoch named his son Methuselah. Methuselah means his death shall bring. And the year Methuselah died was the year the flood came. He was a prophet who understood the judgment of God and even understood when the judgment of God would arrive. But here's what I like about Enoch. Because he was a man who feared the Lord and even warned others about the judgment of the Lord, God took him before the judgment came. In fact, Enoch was, dare I say, raptured. He was snatched out prior to the judgment upon the world. He's a picture of a type of the church of God. Listen, there's a good reason we want to live for the Lord in this world. We want to stand up for Jesus Christ. We want to be Dios no natao. Because we understand, dalit na lang, maabot si Jesus. And we want to be ready. We want to be prepared so that we understand that when the Lord comes, we're getting out of here before the judgment comes again. The great tribulation of God. Revelation chapter 6, verse chapter 6 through 18. And the important thing is, is recognizing that we avoid that by making sure that we have that relationship with Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 says that when the Lord comes, when he blasts that trumpet, he makes that shout, the voice of the archangel, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the Lord forever in the clouds. We want to be like Enoch. I like Enoch. I like that. He's an example, a picture, an illustration of the church of God. But I also like verses 25 through 27, Methuselah. For Methuselah was a prophecy. It was a prophecy that his death shall bring. When he died, the flood would come. He is the oldest man in the Bible. Meaning God waited as possibly long as he could before he brought the judgment upon mankind. The oldest man was the one that brought the judgment of God. I love that because you see that picture, that Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Hey, listen, God is not slow concerning his promises. He does not want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to eternal life. You might sit there and go, You know, wala pinakan sa mga sa pilog sa kalibutan sa wang kaysa lawayan to Lord, pour out your wrath. Bring your judgment. Let's start the tribulation. Jesus, come back right now because I want to see this place fry. Why is God waiting? Kai, he's loving, gracious, does not want that any should perish. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He's giving as much time as he possibly can for mankind to turn. He did it with Methuselah, Omaman Subong. But there's a third and final thing that we notice here in this genealogy. And this one, again, is subtle. And again, it's in the names in the genealogy. Because we read it, we read Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. And we go, okay, sigi, anona. That's the Hebrew. Let me read you their names in English. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing life. It is the gospel and the names of the genealogy from Adam to Noah. They what? Because this one, don't miss this. Because this is actually the first time that the gospel is clearly presented. And it's hidden. It's so subtle. It's in names. You read over it without even paying attention to it. But this is the first clear presentation of the gospel. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. In other words, man is appointed to die. Man is appointed to be separated from God. We have been separated because of our sin. But the heavenly Father will come down. God will come down. Teaching us, declaring that His death shall bring the despairing life. That is the gospel in Genesis 5. I love that. It shows the plan and the purposes of God from the very beginning. 
Man rebelled. Two paths. Canaan and his descendants walked away and hardened their hearts to God, but God never gave up on man. And there was a line that chose to follow man. And God through them brought the salvation of mankind through Jesus Christ. What we'll pick up next week is we come to the flood of Noah is God finally brings the judgment upon a world that has rejected him. Pamago, questions? Comment. Comment. You have it in Genesis 3. The seed of the woman will strike the head of the serpent. You have it in Genesis 5. Very clearly in Genesis 5. The Heavenly Father, He will come down teaching that His death will bring us life. So I want to get Helen, the very beginning, the gospel message was always there. We too can be raptured as we walk with God. The testimony of God, in fact, there's a great verse. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was taken away and did not taste death because he was found to have pleased God. If we please the Lord, if we walk with the Lord, that's where we get to avoid the judgment of God that will come again upon the world. Yeah, there's great examples. Again, it's a, it's a little chapter. You almost could read over without paying attention to it because it just seems like a bunch of names. But there's got some gems in that one. Beautiful picture of the gospel. Beautiful picture of the rapture of the church and the grace and the long-suffering of God. Pamako? Yes, sir, Ben. Who was Cain? Cain was going to be hiding from his brothers. First child was Cain. Second child was Abel. But the thought is, and that's where you get from Genesis chapter 5 verse 4, they had many, possibly many, many other sons and daughters. Cain would have been hiding from either his direct siblings or even their children. We will see next week, there's not few people. When you have the mathematics behind a long life, you're thinking, mind you, people didn't die until they were 900 years old. So let's say they're having kids for the first, you know, five, six hundred years of that. You have a kid every couple of years. I mean, Adam and Eve could have realistically had hundreds of children. Their children have hundreds of children. You have exponential growth. The population of the world at the time of the flood could have been comparable to today in the billions. And that's with a short lifespan. That's living to be maybe 100 years old, less than that, maybe 80, 90. You live to be 900, your math suddenly explodes. You have, have you ever heard of what's called exponential growth? It's exponential growth. You, you're, the size of the population in the world isn't a matter of going from 10 to 20 to 30. It's 10 to 50 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000. So damo, damo, say, that's where the whole idea is. You're going to have potentially big cities. We'll get there. We'll talk about that just in Simana. We'll get to it with a flood. Because one of the questions you ask is, is, it, it doesn't take much. But the math behind it, we'll get into a little bit of that, but the math behind it actually is, is that there was a lot of people that Cain would have been afraid of. And the city could have been a very large city in a very short amount of time because they lived such long lives. If they only lived to be 50 years, you wouldn't have seen that, 100 years. No. No. 
Adam and Eve were thrown out. No. There was no one before him. It would have been his younger siblings. And it wasn't his magulang, it would have been his manghod. Younger kids, or even, by the way, because you're living so long, if you live to be 900 years old, I mean, you're talking, we're not talking about kids or grandkids or great-grandkids. Your great-great-great-great-great-grandkids could have been old enough to kill you and you're still alive. Because they had such long lives, you have an incredible population explosion. People aren't dying. So there would have been many, many. Cain was the first son. There was no one before him as a son. He was the first. He was the one who said, I have acquired. He is my, my hope for being the salvation. But he turned out not to be. Correct. So how many kids could he have had by that point? If he started having kids when he was 20, you could have had, could have had nearly 100 kids by that point. All right, let's pray. If you've got more questions, by all means, come up afterwards. But let's, uh, let's finish up with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this evening. Lord, we thank you for the example that you give us in two different paths that we can take, Lord, very clearly laid out for us. There is a path that rejects you a path that walks away from you, Lord, and is a path that leads to destruction. But there's a path that follows you. Lord, a desire, Lord, to know you and have a relationship with you, that path leads to life. And Lord, you are so long-suffering, you are so long, so patient, so gracious. Lord, desiring that all men would find that way of life, that narrow path that leads to you. And Lord, we pray that that is exactly what we do Lord, and as well as what we share with others that they should do. Because Jesus, it is simply all about you. So we love you. We thank you. We thank you for your goodness, for the gospel message that you came down, that we might live. In Jesus' name we say, amen.